Welcome to episode seven of AmateurLogic.tv. I'm George. And I'm Jim. And we got one fellow missing today. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll tell you more about that in a minute. There has been a lot going on, hasn't there? Boy, I tell you, there's been a lot going on since we last got an episode out. You notice that we didn't have one in April. Yeah. Well, I wasn't even uh, at home in April much. Um, you were on the road a lot. I was, yeah. I started Where out. How did you go? Well, I went to uh, Los Angeles to start with, uh, out to the home office of the company, and worked out there for a few days. Then we drove over to Las Vegas for the NAB show that oh, happens yeah. every spring. It's the largest uh, multimedia broadcast type show in the world. I've never been, but I've always wanted to uh, go. Oh, man, you need to come one year. It's usually about 100,000 people in attendance. Uh, it, Fills up pretty much all of the Las Vegas Convention Center. Now, and Tommy's been. Tommy's been a number of years. Tommy and I uh, used to go together every year. Uh, oh, I wouldn't even venture a guess. He's been at least eight or nine times, I would say. I'm always the last one. <laughs> we'll get you out one year. Anyway, it is a lot of work. It is a lot of work. I'm sure it is. And I spent a little time in um, Nashville since... Uh, last time we had an episode as well. Okay. Of course, so Tommy's been moving. Tommy's gone. He Well, not <laughs> completely it, gone. Don't say it like that. <laughs> yeah. Tommy has left the building. <laughs> <laughs> no, Tommy's actually moved to take a new job in Missouri. So uh, he will be in future episodes with us. Um, it'll just be through the magic of the Internet and the U.S. Postal Service. Yeah. Tommy, there's been a lot going on this past month, but Tommy still has a lot going on. He's moving all his stuff, and I think he's actually moving into his house up there maybe... I think this weekend. This weekend, yeah. The man has been without broadband for over a month now. And it's, al <laughs> it's almost done him in. Yeah, but he he does have good news. He should have DSL on next yeah. Thursday. Yeah, he's he actually placed... <laughs> <laughs> he actually placed his DSL order before he closed on his new house. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when it lo started looking good, he, he made the call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's an important thing to a geek. You know, you got to have right. that broadband. I love it. He's oh. more or less been living in this travel trailer for the past month. And, uh, yeah. but, you know, uh, we've been in contact with him, and we found a pretty neat way to do it, being amateur radio operators. Yeah, and you discovered this on your... Your travel and trials, didn't you? Actually, yeah. I uh, set this up so that when I was gone for two or three weeks back in April, I was able to get back in and uh, talk on my two-meter radio to some of my friends around town. Including me? Including you. And including and, uh, Tommy? Tommy and a couple of others. Even well, though Tommy was in Missouri? Even though Tommy was in Missouri. So you were in where? I was in, uh, well, for a little while I was in uh, Los Angeles. And then uh, for a week or so, I was in Las Vegas, spent a little time in Nashville, and in all these places, I was able to talk to all of my friends from my uh, radio right here at home. Wow. And for those that are not in the know, two-meter radios, generally speaking, are local coverage, not long distance. Yeah, you might. Uh, well, just uh, car to car, you might talk, what, 10 or 15 miles? Yeah. If you had good open terrain. With the base station antenna at home, uh, talking to a car, you might uh, 20, 30. Mm. Yeah, that's about right. Base station to base station will go a little further than that. Right. Then we do have repeaters where there'll be a uh, radio located on a tall tower, so they may be four or 500 feet. Yeah. And we just transmit locally, and it comes out through the repeater up at a much higher height. And that extends our coverage on out, what, you'd say 75 miles possibly yeah. on some of them? Yep, I'd say that's about right. Depends a lot on the antenna height. Height yep. is everything. More than power. Yes. Anyway. Uh, so we got any footage of that good stuff? Yes, we do. And it's called Echo Link. Welcome to another segment of From the Bench. I'm your host, George. And this is the part of the program where we like to delve a little bit deeper into technology than just your desktop. Uh, we might build projects here, uh, delve a little into electronics. We might take something apart to see what makes it tick. We might play with ham radio uh, items, uh, just whatever I happen to be involved in at the moment that I think uh, you might like to see. 
Now, as you know, most of us in uh, amateur logic land here have been kind of scattered out for the past month or better all over the U.S. Um, Tommy has just recently moved to Missouri, so uh, he's not here with us every day. Uh, I was gone for two weeks in Los Angeles and then in Las Vegas uh, due to the NAB show, and we've got a little footage here in the show about that. You know, we're all ham radio operators, and we enjoy uh, talking with each other frequently, if not almost daily. And being out of state uh, causes a little problems with that. There are certain bands in the ham radio spectrum that are high frequency, and these are better for propagating over long distances, like across the U.S. or around the world. Now, to have uh, privileges to operate in that band, you have to take certain tests, and just like any amateur radio license, and uh, the entry level these days would be considered the technician class license, and it does not include uh, HF privileges. Well, uh, Jim, Tom, and I are all technicians and have been uh, for over 10 years now. Uh, I think, actually, Jim, maybe he's a general now. I think he upgraded. But Tom and I are still technicians, and we <clears throat> don't use uh, HF communications. We limit our communications primarily to uh, VHF and UHF. Uh, these are FM rigs that we normally use in the uh, 5 to 50 watt range and uh, they operate in the 145, 46, 47 megahertz band as well as the uh, 440 band for UHF. Now uh, there's naturally a limit on VHF and UHF communications much shorter than HF. Typical mobile-to-mobile -mobile VHF communications is limited probably 5 to 10 miles, depending on the terrain. You can stretch it out, though, with a repeater up to uh, 75 miles or so, uh, just depending on the height of the uh, repeater tower. But that's not nearly far enough to talk uh, out of state. And uh, in that case, what does ham radio do? Well, we rely on the Internet and voice over IP technology. There's a great program out there called Echolink. Now, there's another one called IRLP, which I'm not as familiar with, but maybe one day we'll take a look at that. Anyway, Echolink is a great uh, tool for amateur radio operators. Sorry, if you're not a ham, you can't use this, but uh, then you probably wouldn't be talking on the amateur radios anyway. With Echolink, uh, we're able to take a radio in one location and link it to a radio in another location using voice over IP technology through the internet. Uh, this is great. When I was in uh, uh, Los Angeles and uh, Vegas recently, I was able to take my notebook computer and using a microphone, I was able to uh, use even a dial-up connection and connect back to my Echolink node here at home which I had left on uh, my two meter uh, radio and I had left the uh, local repeater frequency dialed in. So I was able to take my notebook computer in my hotel room in California and call back in and talk to my radio here in Jackson, Mississippi. So uh, it was great for that. Now in the meantime Tommy has moved to Missouri and that's how we communicate with him daily now. He uh, still hasn't settled on a house yet, so um, he's not able to set up his own Echolink node up there. But in this case, what we do is rely on a repeater in the area that uh, has Echolink capability. Uh, they're both uh, repeaters and individual simplex links uh, on the Echolink system uh, all over the world. I mean, if you're an amateur radio operator, you really should take a look at Echolink. Now to demonstrate how Echolink would work with the computer to radio interface, our friend Bill in 5YCK is about to connect with me uh, using his computer and a dial-up uh, connection to the internet. Now on my end I have a uh, cable modem and that's connected to my computer which is connected to a 2 meter radio and then I'm listening on this uh, radio here. Link. There's Bill now. This is November 5, Yankee Charlie Kilowatt on the uh, N5SPP link. Good evening, Bill. This is uh, N5SPP, George. Uh, good to hear you here. we uh, getting a good signal on you tonight. Uh, we're talking with everyone here about Echolink and showing them how versatile it is. 
Uh, Bill and I are actually close enough to hear each other um, through a local repeater here. But as far as talking uh, simplex, uh, direct communications between us, that's not possible every night. Uh, so Echolink would make a good solution for us to, uh, to use in those cases. And uh, Bill's been using Echolink a little longer than me. Bill, how long have you been uh, preaching Echolink <laughs> before we decided to get on board? I've been messing with uh, Echolink for approximately uh, uh, three or four years here. Uh, several incarnations of uh, the same program. Uh, being I'm not a great typist nor am I a great speller, uh, Echolink works great for me. Yeah, it works great for me too, and especially since I don't have an HF license uh, or uh, class of license that allow HF transmissions currently. Echolink allows me to talk all over the world, and uh, it's uh, it's really been great here. I've only been playing with it a couple of months, so there's a lot more to it than I understand myself. Yeah, I'm sure you'd probably say the same thing. We're learning new things about it daily. Well, we appreciate you uh, connecting here with us this afternoon and giving us a quick uh, look and showing us how Echo Link works. Okay, Roger, George. Uh, yeah, uh, this is a, a good way to get around the world. We'll catch you later. To learn more about Echo Link, visit www.echolink.org. Remember, you must be a licensed ham radio operator. Oh, man, George. That is cool stuff. That Echo Link is. Yes. Our friend Bill had been telling me about it for a number of years. And, you know, we just kind of blew it off. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't pay much attention to it, but it was really nice to have when I was out of town. It almost Let's made see. it like I, I was right at home in the evenings. Sure sounds home. like it. Yeah. Sure sounds like uh, it. And as soon as Tommy gets moved in here, he'll be setting up an Echo Link uh, node at his new home. And then, in the afternoons when uh, we all head home from work, we can all jump on the radios in our vehicles, like always, and, and communicate Tom with each other, even though Tommy's several states away. And, you know, it's kind of, uh, this one thing about uh, radio is, yeah, the Internet's nice, and you can tie together just about anything, but uh, before the Internet, that's what people did. They did it with radio. Oh, yeah, that was the original instant messenger. <laughs> well, maybe telegraph beat it out a little bit on yeah. that. Yeah, maybe so. But uh, you know what's cool about Echolink also? What's that? It, uh, it runs on Linux. Oh. It runs on Mac OS X. I didn't know they had a version for Mac. Yep, yep. And uh, runs on not only two meters, which is the kind of radios we've been talking about here, but also other types of radios. Oh, yeah. Yeah, basically, I guess any uh, two-way radio it would work on. Yeah. And you know, it's not just here in the United States either. Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, if you don't watch out, you'll hear some foreign language, won't you? <laughs> as a matter of fact, I did last <laughs> night. I was just sitting there, and uh, some guy from Germany connected to my Echolink node uh, Right there, and I heard him come on and say something in German, and then he cleared. So uh, maybe <laughs> he said sorry. Sprechen Sie Dutch? I didn't get that far with him. <laughs> anyway, so it's an international uh, phenomenon. It works really good and extends the capabilities of radio greatly. But now it doesn't replace radio by any means. You know, we were, uh, well, yeah. we're all Hurricane Katrina uh, veterans around here. Well, we've been veterans of several hurricanes. In this particular case, Echolink uh, might have helped around the outer edges, but in the very middle where the storm hit, there was no internet. So <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, so this there was anything. Yeah, strictly back to one-on-one uh, -on -one radios, no fancy repeater systems or any of that. All of that stuff went down. So just something to keep in mind. Anybody planning yep. emergency communications? Yep, very true. You know, Echolink. Uh, I was thinking about it. It can be useful for other things. Oh, there's a lot of things you can do with Echolink. There's a lot of other ways you can tie into it as well. And we're going to be looking at that in a future episode here. We're going to show you how to hack Echolink to do some really cool stuff. Yeah. And now, these hacks also apply to other things as well. Um, you could use this, uh, anybody doing a, a podcast or a vidcast, 
Oh yeah, you use, use this these. interface to hook up lots of different things to yeah. your computer. Yep, uh, not just a radio. So um, you'll want to check that episode out yeah. <laughs> when we have it. Yeah, that'd be cool. Jim, what are you bringing to us this time? Well, we're going to continue our look at some computer tools, uh, mainly the one we've been looking at and we'll look at again this time is uh, a networking tool called NMAP, cool. Network Mapper. And uh, we're going to do some cool stuff across the Internet. Cool. Real live stuff. Against some people that don't even know we're doing it. I mean, not 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 against. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to do some hacking, would you say? Well, no, not exactly. We're going to do some reconnaissance. Okay. As if we were getting ready to hack someone. Sometimes reconnaissance is all you need. Very true. Well, as promised, here's another look at Nmap. Today we're going to go out across the internet and scan a real live internet facing host. Someone that doesn't even know that we're going to scan them. Now stay tuned because this could get interesting. So here we go on our little Nmap Linux journey. Let's see what we want to play with today. I think I'll do my previous employer. I left on good terms. Maybe they'll forgive me. And if they don't, oh well. Okay, we've got our www name up there. Here we go. It's hard to really tell how well this is working. I see from my other little window up here, which shows network activity that we are either putting out some traffic or getting some traffic back in. So we know there's something going on. We're only scanning one host, so it really shouldn't take a very long time. Ooh, even more network activity. I may be being scanned in response. You know, a lot of internet-facing hosts these days are not just passive, they are active. Not only are they active, they are reactive. Some places now even have honeypots set up. If you go in and, and exhibit undesirable behavior, they will run some algorithms to identify you, trace the TCP IP path to you, and then they will reset your connection and block you at the firewall. And we're getting some feedback now. Warning, RST from port 53. Is this port really open? It's a reset flag coming from port 53. Not good, that means they detected us probably. Insufficient responses for TCP sequencing. OS detection may be less accurate. Interesting ports on. SMTP is filtered. Port 53 is open. It's running uh, XNS mail on port 58. Not sure what that is. Port 63 is filtered. 73 is filtered. 80 is open. Ooh, they've apparently changed this box out and it's now a Microsoft box. It was a Unix derivative when I left AIX which would have been much better, much safer, much more secure. I don't know, there's a lot of ports open. Yeah, uh, it could be a Linux derivative running Samba, but clearly ports 135 and 139 are open, which are NetBIOS port 445 is open, which just about clinches the fact that this is a Microsoft box. Well, MS SQL port is open. So the box is running Microsoft SQL Server, which means the box could probably be had for just a little hacking. I'm really surprised that my former employer has taken this turn. Managers who really don't know a lot about IT side with the Windows faction because they've heard of Windows and Windows Server. When it comes to putting a box on the Internet, Windows can be made as secure as a Linux box or a Linux derivative, Unix derivative box, but it's hard. You really gotta lock the box down tight 
and you really got to know how to lock the box down tight. It's much easier, much easier with a Linux box, for example. But anyway, there you go. We've scanned this box. We know what the OS is with relative certainty. We uh, know what ports we would attack if we were a hacker and wanted to own this box. So there you are. So there you have it, a real live scan of a host across the internet. Got a little interesting there. During the scan, didn't know if maybe some uh, reciprocal action was being taken by the far end host. It can happen. Be careful out there. If you decide to go out and experiment, don't encourage you to scan anybody or anything that wouldn't be okay with you scanning them. So play nicely in the sandbox. So until next time, we'll see you later. Wow, Jim, that's really spooky. Yeah, there's a lot of scary stuff out there on the Internet that you can't necessarily see. Nmap's kind of like a light or flashlight in that regard. It just uh, shines on something and exposes all those dirty little secrets. <laughs> <laughs> if we were a hacker... Yeah. <laughs> It's easy. If you were a disgruntled ex-employee, you could have had some fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, fortunately, I left on good terms <laughs> yeah. and would never, ever do anything like that anyway. Hey, what about uh, that good stuff we were talking about earlier from your travels? You got any more video on Yeah, that? here's a little bit of footage that I shot while I was at the NAB show. I'm going to be honest, I was out there at work, <laughs> not to be a journalist. <laughs> Oh, sure. So uh, I didn't have time to go through and uh, cover everything on the floor, but there is some other footage. If you search around the Internet, I believe Digital Life Television had a little. Translation, he didn't go out there to, I mean, he went out there to work. Translation is, he was sitting by the pool with a pina colada. Everybody knows <laughs> you don't sit by the pool in Las Vegas. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they won't let you sit there. They want you booked to a machine somewhere. But anyway, I, I did it. gamble a little. I probably, oh, Maybe ten dollars or so in a week. Spun so. wheel or? Uh, uh, I just I, mean, I like the one arm bandits. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a quota I try to spend out there every year to help promote the economy there. <laughs> help but it's usually the... under twenty dollars. So. <laughs> so. Help them with the Vegas economy. I yeah. know they appreciate it. <laughs> well, let's take a look here. Yeah. Do you know what those are, Jim? No idea. Actually, I have seen those before. Those are FM antennas. Ah, I recognize them now. Used to be out on the tower at the radio station. Yeah, you usually see eight or ten of them stacked up on a tower on the side of it. That's some, an, that's called an array, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Some uh, stations will, or towers will have more than one FM station on it. This is one of the digital audio systems from the show. This is a CDS content delivery system by uh, Pristine Systems, my company. Ah, and we've got, and what would this be used for, George? Uh, this is what you're hearing on the air when uh, they play a record or commercial or anything. It's ah. coming off the hard drive off of this system. I see. Also, uh, we showed our black box logger, which can record up to 16 different AM and FM radio stations at once. Wow. Yeah, a lot of data. You can fill up a 200 gig hard drive like that. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Cool, though. Let's see. Flashy lights. Flashy in lights, cases. yeah. You know oh, I lights? recognize that. Those are big lights, too, aren't they? Yeah. I've seen those. Where have I seen those before? You've probably seen those on top of a radio tower. That's where I was. Just kidding. <laughs> I actually, my first encounter with one of those was on top of a tower. I had. I had no idea it was that big. <laughs> <laughs> now, oh, Leo Laporte's this. favorite microphones. Hile one microphones. Of, one of my favorite uh, sound brands, yeah, they're sound or audio brands. Big in amateur radio, too. Yeah, they are big in amateur radio. Now, this is a little console like might be used in a TV post-production facility. It looks like the one we use in Amateur Logic. Well, no, this one's not. <laughs> this one's a Euphonics. Uh, oh, I see. It's a different brand. We use the Mackie brand, right? Yeah, we use the Mackie. 48 little, channel, or well, Sour 64, I can't uh, remember. More like uh, 16, I think. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> now, do you recognize that? Uh, 
Sure. <laughs> All right. <laughs> You'll see these at the bottom of a lot of AM towers. This oh, is, the box has just always been closed when I've seen it. Yeah, this is the antenna tuning unit. You're kidding. No, nope, this is it. There's nothing automatic about it either. <laughs> Everything in here is set by hand, locked down for the specific frequency that the radio station is on. Ah. So that's how they can take a tower that's not the actual correct length for that frequency and match it oh. so that the transmitter thinks it's operating into a perfect match. I understand. Now this is for your rig. If you need a dummy load, here's a little 150 kW model that they had on the floor. <laughs> Uh, by comparison, the one for my ham radio I can hold in my hand. Yeah, me too. <laughs> this one actually would be um, for a television transmitter or maybe a short wave station or something because there Let's are see. no, uh, really no FM stations over 100 kW. And none of them run 100 kW worth of transmitter power. The antennas multiply the gain on them. Right, right. I do remember that. Now, this is the premier audio card used in the radio industry. These are made by Audio Science. It's uh, one that we use. They also make a tuner card you'll see up there at the top. That's what was in our logger that records 16 stations at once. There's eight tuners wow. on this one card, and we could put two tuners in wow. the system. Two cards. Two cards. 16 yeah, tuners. 16 tuners. Here's Electro Voices microphones. Oh, no. They were I do love well. Electro Voice microphones. Yes, I've got a couple of microphones. I've nice got ones. one. Yep. Got one on my ham radio. Sure do. That's right. You do, don't you? Now here's another tower light. This one, believe it or not, is using uh Is that a strobe? I think that was a strobe. Here's Sure microphones. Good now, brand. Now this is a, uh, uh, I believe, an HD radio transmitter. You'll notice that now they even have uh, computer displays built in the front. Whoa, that looks now, familiar. <laughs> what do you think that is? Well, I recognize the helical coil... I bet that, let me see, it's about the size for a 2.4 gig antenna? I really don't know. <laughs> I'm assuming <laughs> since it was at the Sure booth, though, it was uh, some kind of wireless microphone receiver antennas. I bet there it is. There you go. UHF, wireless system. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's what it is. Now, here's one of the best transmitters made, FM transmitters. This is a continental transmitter. These really? are available as just regular uh, standard um, FM modulation and also with HD radio. Did you used to, we're going to have to talk about HD radio a little bit. Did you, I think you used to engineer on one of I these, used to, didn't you? Yeah, I had a station that uh, used one. Well, I had two stations that used these and they're the, well, I won't say the Cadillac, I would say the rolls Whoa. of transmitters. The absolute cat's meow. In my book, anyway. <laughs> okay, now tell me a little bit about HD Radio, okay. I've heard of HD TV. Okay, HD Radio is a new digital radio system uh, produced by the Ubiquity Company, and it's starting to come in new cars. You'll be seeing really? a lot more about it soon. Yeah, digital wow. FM and AM. Digital, so wow, digital AM. That could really. You correct me if I'm wrong, but. That could like go a long way toward revitalizing that band? It possibly could. It really does sound good. Really does sound good. And uh, on the FM side, what's also exciting is they have determined they can uh, split the bandwidth uh, between several different channels. So some of these stations, when they go digital, are they HD. They have multiple... It'll be multiple channels on there. Wow, so one current radio station like you think of one current radio station could really be three radio yeah, stations. Yeah, three or possibly even four. Um, just by reducing the data rate of each channel, you can do that. Now, my question is, what's it going to sound like? I've heard them say that 48 uh, kilohertz bit uh, rate sounds as good as regular FM. Well, we'll have to see. Yeah. <laughs> Depends a lot we'll on the equipment, I guess. The I guess receivers. it does. Yeah. We'll see. Here's some more FM antennas. These are uh, panel antennas. If you'll notice, there is uh, an identical antenna around each side of that tower, and that's so that it gets the same coverage all the way around. Sector antennas. Now, mm. this is transmission line, like what uh, oh. we used 
to connect. I see that. Yeah, well, yeah. you probably have some of that on the left there. Probably. This is another view of the uh, panel mount FM antennas. Cool. You would normally find these like on a uh, real tall tower where the face is real wide on it, and there would be significant shadowing if the antenna was only on one leg. Ah, I see. This gives it a good circular pattern all the way around the tower. Yes. Prevents the tower from interfering with the output signal. Yeah. Now, you notice these things right here on top of this tower, the little spiky deals? Uh, yeah, way up at the top? Yeah. Oh, that has something to do with lightning. Yep. What, that's not actually a lightning rod. You might at first say it's a lightning rod. Oh, it's, uh, I know, it's a uh, static electricity something. Yeah, it's a static electricity something. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I don't know if they call it a static drain. I'm not sure what the uh, official name of that is. But the way that works is those sharp pointy spikes are sticking up there above the tower. As the wind blows the clouds by that are charged, huh. it, they can bleed off some of that charge into these sharp spikes easily before it, it gets up enough voltage to create a lightning strike. Wow. In other words, this yeah. drains off the charge from the cloud to prevent lightning. Believe it or not, I've seen something similar, a similar design, in a completely different uh, I don't doubt it. Field. Uh, or uh, discipline, or it's not even, it's a, actually a recreational pursuit. They put something similar on the top of sailboat masts. Oh, okay. For the same reason. You'll see this on a lot of buildings nowadays, too, especially around airports. You'll see some little weird looking spiky things hanging around. Now you know what the weird little spiky things are for. You wouldn't want to meet a guy in an alley holding the other end of that yeah. <laughs> and running at you, kind of spinning it or something like that. <laughs> Not unless you had a good 5,000 volts handy. Yeah. Yeah, then you could that. knock him on the ground right quick. <laughs> Here, take this. <laughs> oh. Now, here's the world's biggest car radio. <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> Actually, it's a mock-up. I know, I know what this goes in. It goes in those big things you see, like on Monster Machine. You, oh, okay, you know, yeah, the monster you know that, trucks. Yeah, the monster trucks, that guy, yeah. that one that, you know. Yeah. There's some more uh, consoles that uh, you'd probably find at the higher-end radio stations, if I, not at TV stations. I think I've actually worked on one similar to that. Not oh, more FM antennas. Oh, and a look, lot of them. They can look completely different from the other ones we've seen. Now here's a nice little console here. Yeah, that's the one I worked at. <laughs> Just kidding. I've never even seen one like that before. Wow, I really do have to go because that is where all the cool stuff is. It really is. I mean, it's not just radio and television. It's multimedia as well. There's a lot of Internet technologies there, too. And it's huge. How it big is, huge. is the place where all the stuff is on display? Well, I believe I overheard someone uh, talking about it uh, while I was at the show, and they said that those buildings would hold about 68 football fields. <laughs> Gosh, <laughs> it is huge. It's huge. I, it's, I wouldn't be surprised if it's not the biggest building in the world. Probably not. I, I suspect it's the biggest convention center, though. Oh, I bet it is. Yeah, I Las know, Vegas. Uh, the reason that this show is only in Las Vegas anymore is because it's the only city large enough that has enough hotel rooms to hold all the attendees. Wow. Definitely down for next year. Well, that's it for Episode 7. Yeah, it's uh, come just as quickly as it started, it seems. Uh, we've enjoyed it, and uh, we're going to take a break for the summer. Yeah, it's the end of the season, as it were. And if it's good enough for NBC, it's good enough for us. <laughs> However, there will be a next season. Yeah, we hope to be back this fall to bring you some more exciting technical geek type of stuff. More amateur logic. Yep, more amateur radio, more uh, photo tips. More network tools, more computer programs. So we hope you join us back then. So until next time, I'm Jim. And I'm George. And with your logic. And Tommy's in. <laughs> Tommy. <laughs> Our proxy for Tommy, who's still moving in Missouri. That's it for Amateur Logic. We look forward to seeing you this fall. Bye.
I have no idea what just happened. But I don't think it was good. There you go, sports. <laughs> you yeah. heard it here first.